Well, good morning again. It is uh, good to be with you. It is always good to be with you. It is always good to uh, gather in his name together as a family. And today we are in Core 11. We are continuing in our sub-series of Core 11, Singing the Sacred. And we went through Psalm 2 last week, and we talked about the most familiar piece of Scripture that you know, uh, John 3.16 last week, and how it alludes to Psalm chapter 2. And this week for Core 11, we're going to be talking about probably the second most familiar piece of Scripture that you know, and that is Psalm 23. Uh, the first three verses serve as our memory verse for this week, and they go, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. Uh, some of the uh, memory verses that we've done have been a bit tricky. This one's probably going to be a little easier, even though it's longer, because it is so familiar. And that, that imagery of shepherd, if you are a church person or you grew up in the church, is a familiar one. And sometimes we, we hear these uh, metaphors or we hear these statements and we're so used to them that we don't even think about how extraordinary they are sometimes or how strange they are in other times. And really shepherd as the metaphor that it is in terms of being a prolific leader in the Bible stands out as one of the more uh, bizarre metaphors in a long list of bizarre and strange illustrations in the Bible. The shepherd leader. And today's psalm was penned by the shepherd king, King David. He was the youngest son of uh, Jesse, and he was actually shepherd by default of being the youngest and lowest ranking member of his family. So low, in fact, that when Samuel came to anoint one of Jesse's sons as king, David was not even invited to the meeting. And the reason he wasn't at the meeting was because he was, in fact, out in the field tending to the sheep. For the shepherd, it wasn't a great job. It, you know, there wasn't a lot of young kids uh, in Jerusalem that day saying, when I grow up, I want to be a shepherd. That's what I want to be. It was, it was smelly. It was, it was long hours. It was a thankless job. It was hard work, and it really was meant for the lowest in society. Shepherds of that day were not known for their uh, worldly prowess. They uh, were more so known probably by their uh, odor, if you will. You know, they, 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 they smelled like their sheep, right? Maybe better suited, they reeked of their sheep. And yet, even so, God raises up this king, King David, from the shepherd's field. And when we think about shepherds, notably the, the angels told the shepherds first when Jesus was born, and commonly it's pointed to this idea of shepherd or shepherding in terms of leadership in the Bible, both for uh, how church leaders operate as pastors or elders, but also in how we seek the Lord as our true leader and the shepherd of us all. And we see this, this theme of this good shepherd, Jesus, run throughout Scripture. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 25, it says, Once you were like sheep who wandered away, but now you have turned to your shepherd, the guardian of your souls. See, shepherds are meant to lead their sheep. And they know each of their sheep. And because they interact with the sheep and call out to the sheep so often, the sheep respond to the shepherd because they know his voice. They know his voice because there is a familiarity that's been established over time. That the shepherd has called to them, the shepherd has directed them, led them, protected them. They have a deep connection to him. It's a bond and it's a trust. Uh, you've heard me talk about, I, I talk about him often, about, about my dad. And, and I, I love my dad. And as a child, I trusted him deeply and completely. I, I really, I still do. And dad was never one of those, like, kind of hard to read dads. 
uh, he, he kind of wears it on his sleeve. But even in our house, we just, we, we knew the temperature of the room with dad. You knew when things were light and you knew when things were heavy. But you always knew, whether it was in praise or in correction, that he, he loved me. I, I never, never doubted it. It was never a question at all. I trusted that he did. And as a child, I deeply trusted that he could and that he would make everything okay. There is a, a bond of familiarity that creates this trust. We see it in John chapter 10, verse 14. It says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep, and they know me. And so a shepherd leads his sheep. Shepherds, too, were entrusted to protect their sheep. That the shepherd had a deep concern and a lasting care for each of the sheep. He knew exactly how many he had to take care of and to make sure that they were all in the fold, all protected and all cared for. On page 76 of your copy of Core 52, it says, leadership is no longer what you get from the sheep, but what you sacrifice for the sheep. And we see the shepherd as leader is one who puts himself in harm's way to protect the sheep. On the road to Goliath, remember that David talked about sparing sheep from the, the paw of the lion and the bear, that he would strike them down. And this is what is part of what makes this such a, a beautiful and also complete metaphor of Christ's love for us, because it is complete even to death. He would put himself in harm's way to protect his sheep. I'm reminded of this in John chapter 10, verse 11. It says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. And that's who I want to lead me. The good shepherd, Jesus Christ. We see too in Revelation 7, verse 17, it says, For the Lamb on the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of life-giving water. And God will wipe every tear from their eyes. As Jesus is our shepherd, he wants to lead us and he wants to protect us. And for us to be assured that he provides all that we need. Everything that we need for this life. The book of Hebrews, chapter 13, verses 20 and 21, says... Now may the God of peace who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, and ratified an eternal covenant with his blood, may he equip you with all you need for doing his will. May he produce in you through the power of Jesus Christ every good thing that is pleasing to him, all glory to him forever and ever. Amen. And so he not only protects us and leads us, but he gives us all we need to thrive in this life. And David expresses this beautifully in the 23rd Psalm. And we're actually going to go through this Psalm this morning line by line. So let's dive in to the 23rd Psalm. You can turn to it in your Bible or you can follow along uh, on the screen. It begins, the Lord is my shepherd. And, and we've kind of established that already, that God is shepherd and his desire is to lead and to care for his sheep. But in that, his desire is to be personal. It's to have a personal relationship. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. Not our shepherd, although he is. But there's personal language that's taking place here. The Lord is my shepherd. And God desires a personal relationship with each of his sheep. But for him to be your shepherd, you must see yourself as his sheep. Now, think about that for a second. To see ourselves as a sheep. 
What does that look like? All right? It's easy when uh, I go down to Precious Jewels Daycare uh, with the kids and I sing, you know, I just want to be a sheep, and they all sing it because it's the song. Right? But for us, in, uh, as adults, if somebody calls you a sheep, it's usually an insult. Right? When, if somebody calls you a sheep, you know, they're not notably super intelligent animals. Uh, if somebody calls you that, they mean that you're following something blindly. Right? Or that you're being stupid. Or that you're being naive. That's how the world sees it. But when we know who God is and his role as shepherd, we understand it's not about stupidity or, or being naive. It's, it's about trust. God is my shepherd because I trust him deeply. And because I trust him deeply, it says, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I shall not want. Now, God desires that you should have all you need when you seek him first. Remember the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. Seek first his kingdom, and then these things will be added to you. He wants us to be at peace and to find our satisfaction in him. It says, I will not want because everything we need is in the Lord. And so he doesn't want to find us wanting, desiring, striving. Because that is, when we are not satisfied in him, that's what we do. And we always think that satisfaction or that rest is on the other side of that next milestone. And that's why we think, you know, as, as soon as, you know, I get this job, oh, then I'll be set. Or when I drive this car, or if I live in that house, or if I have this much money, or if I'm in this or that relationship. But God does not desire to find us wanting. Because wanting, 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 it always leaves us empty. Because when we get that job, or we have that much money, or we are in this spot that we desire to be, we don't celebrate it very long. We're very much next to, what can I be anxious about getting to next? And here's the truth, loved ones, about wanting, is that we often want things that are no good for us. And it's amazing sometimes how we'll think we want something, and we'll strive for it, strive for it. We never get there, and then something makes us realize, wow, that really wasn't for me. But our satisfaction is in Christ. I will not want. It says, He makes me lie down in green pastures. And God will give you rest when you cast your cares on Him. Peter reminds us, cast your cares on Him because He cares for you. And, and we can do that. And I'll tell you, I, I'll come before God and I, sometimes I get in this rut of this bad habit, and, and maybe you do too, where I come before God and I pray and I I think about the things that maybe I'm striving for, or I think about the things that I'm worried about, or the things that are giving me stress in my life. And I say, God, I put this at your feet, and I want to give you this part of my life, and this is my other worry that I'm carrying, and I have all these burdens, and I lay them all down before the Lord. And then I say, Amen. And I pick them all back up again, and carry them again, because I just cannot let go of the control of those things. But he provides nourishment for our body and for our mind and for our soul. And sometimes he will make you lie down when you need it. We can strive only for so long and sometimes God just puts something in our way that shuts us down when we need it. It says, he leads me by still waters. That's a beautiful image. He will bring you to a place where you can be refreshed by his living water. And you can find calm and you can find peace and you can find love. And he will lead you there. But you have a part to play. Right? Have you ever heard the expression, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink? 
And I think maybe that is true for the sheep sometimes too. You see, God will, will lead you beside still waters, but he will not kick you in. But it's amazing how we will long for opportunities. We'll say, God, please take away my stress. Give me some calm. And then he'll bring something into our lives. But when you, when you pray, when you ask for something, you've got to be ready to receive that thing and see what the Lord has given you. He leads me to the water. But he's not going to push you in. He's not going to force you. He leads me beside still waters. It says, he restores my soul. He restores my soul. God will provide healing as you remain surrendered to him. Uh, no matter what pain or no matter what hurt or what trauma even you have faced. God is a God who makes things new. He's a God who heals. He is a God who restores. And, and loved ones, there is just dark elements of this life that you and I were just never meant to face. We were never intended to face. And this psalm in particular has an almost mystical or magical ability to provide comfort even surrounding death. This is this is a psalm that, that no doubt you have heard at 90 or 95% of the funerals that you've been to. And there's a reason for that. The words of the psalmist talk about this tender and loving shepherd who carries us and brings us strength and comfort and restoration even Surrounding death. It says he leads me in the paths of righteousness. See, God wants to guide you in the paths that you should take. And he does this in a way because, in a way that he knows what's best for us. It's the same that when the shepherd is with his sheep. He's not just out there steering them left and right just for the fun of it or just because he can. It's like, oh, look, I'm the boss of all these sheep, and so I'll make them go over here, I'll make them go over there for no reason. No, he takes them in fields of green and by still waters for what's best for them and what's for best for them at that time. We, we've talked many times about how we get our guidance from this. And that you look at the Bible, all of us ought to look at the Bible as a manual for life. It's the owner's manual for life in this world. And see, it's, it's not just about doing things that are right, although that's in here. But it's doing things that are right because that's the right thing for you. That's the best thing for us. It's not about God being bossy or like some sort of like killjoy on a cosmic scale. He leads me in paths of righteousness for my good and for his glory. And he does so, it says, for his name's sake. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Literally, for Christ's sake. For the purpose that you would honor him. But that you would honor him with your whole life. With every part. The sheep's life is completely surrendered to the shepherd. And it's, sometimes it's easy for people to kind of give up a portion of their life. Or give up half of their life. And that's not what he's asking for. Sometimes people will give up their, you know, the public part. Like, oh, you know, I'll come to church and I'll, you know, I'll raise my hands and I'll sing the songs and I'll, I'll do all that. But in private, it's just not really my jam. I don't really have a lot to do with it there. And they keep that half. Or some people do it the other way. Some people in private is when they, they plead with the Lord. They come before him and say, God, I, I want this and I, and I need that and I need more of you in my life. I want you to bless my life. I want you to show me where I'm supposed to go. 
But then out in public, you would never know that they had anything to do with Christ. They don't acknowledge him in front of their, their co-workers or their classmates or their friends or their family or what have you. But God asks for our whole life, both what is seen and what is unseen. And again, he does this for your good and for his glory. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, even when times are dark, and, and we've all gone through dark times, we've all gone through trying times, even when those times are dark, he promises to lead us. Even if not especially, there may be difficult territory ahead. He is leading, even through the valley of the shadow of death. And all other advisors, loved ones, turn back here. All other, whether it's your, your friends or, or your family member or your doctor, your counselor, Everyone has to turn back. The traveler has to go alone at this point. But that is not the case for the psalmist and is not the case for us. Because the good shepherd walks with us through that dark, terrible valley. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, says, I will fear no evil. I will fear no evil. And the beautiful thing about being connected to, to God in a life-saving way is that we never need to be afraid of evil. Because no matter what it is, God can handle it. No matter how big it is, God is bigger. No matter how great it is, God is greater. Remember it. Remember it by continually putting it in your mind. You can call to mind easily what you continually put in it. And the closer you are to God relationally, the more likely it is that you're going to remember Him in that valley. Or when you encounter that evil and with that in mind, it will determine how you respond. I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. We, we say all the time, you and God are a team that cannot be beat. God promises that he will be with us, that he will always be with us, and so you are not alone. And so I will not fear. It reminds me, I mentioned uh, about my dad uh, earlier, and I had this just inflated view of him and what he could do. And uh, I remember going to a familiar place when all of a sudden uh, approached an unfamiliar dog. And uh, if you know me, you know I love dogs. And I'm not afraid of dogs most of the time, but I was afraid of this dog as a kid, and there was a good reason to be. And it was, a, uh, it was a great big dog, and it was baring its teeth and growling and snapping and barking. And it had all the hair standing up on its, on its back. And I remember being with my dad, my brother, and I. And it came out, and it was ready to be aggressive, and we could tell. And I was afraid of that dog. Uh, but just for a second, my dad kind of snapped his fingers and said, Stay with me, to my brother and I. And... Instantly, I was not afraid of that dog. I didn't even hold my dad's hand. He just walked steady past the dog, and we walked with him. And I wasn't afraid of the dog, because as far as I was concerned, the dog was afraid of dad. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what it is, right? Right? I don't, I don't fear evil, and I don't fear Satan, because Satan fears the Lord. 
The cool thing about us is that we get to fear God out of respect, but we also get to love Him. And we trust in His love for us. And I wasn't afraid because I wasn't alone. Because He was with me. My Father was with me. Remember that. In fear. Whatever that fear is. However rational or irrational that fear is. If you've claimed Jesus and God is with you, that's bigger. And it's always bigger. For you are with me. Your rod and staff, they comfort me. And God will protect with his rod, but he will also prod. And he will push and he will discipline with his staff as needed. And he does that because of how we are connected to him. And it's not always fun. Actually, it's hardly ever fun to be on the discipline end of that rod. But he does that too because we are his. And there's safety in that. You know, that, that's why we feel rest at home. We have that term, home base. And you feel more secure at home because home has rules. Home has order. And even in that safety of home, if you go draw outside the lines, then you'll be brought back inside the lines. And the Lord does that for the ones that he loves, that they would be safe with him. Your rod and staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. See, God will not only protect you, but when you encounter opposing forces, he will provide and bless you in abundance because you are his. He says, you anoint my head with oil. God will honor you. He will bring dignity to you, show you deep respect. He anoints his loved ones, the ones that he cares for and brings to him my cup overflows. See, when God gives, he gives out of his abundance. And his abundance that he gives from, and you cannot outgive God, is unending. In fact, when we, we look at what God has given, we look at what God has provided for us, he gives us even more than we need. When you sit back and think about if the only thing that God ever gave us was his son, Jesus, there's no way that we could even begin to think about paying him back, and yet he gives and he gives and he gives. I'm cared for beyond my needs or my wants, so much that my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. God's promise is of his blessing to us wherever we go. And his goodness will be with us. He, it goes with you even in unfamiliar places. And I will live in the house of the Lord. See, God wants you in his presence. He wants you to be near to him. Talk about walking through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear because you are with me. With me. That's where I want to be is with him. And I will live in the house of the Lord in his presence. He wants to have you close to him, but living in him. That he is now and always home base. And then that last word is beautiful because it sets the time limit. And I will live in the house of the Lord forever. And that's his invitation. And, and forever is not like till the end of the earth, but like not even to the end of time, but into eternity. This, loved ones, is the good shepherd over you and over me. 
And so he calls us, like sheep, to follow him. That's our end of the bargain, to follow him. In Isaiah 53, 6, it says, All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. We need to trust in our shepherd. We need to let him lead, not us. And we need to rest in his protection. And so as you consider your own life, and I want you to think about your own life, as you consider your own life in relation to this Jesus, the good shepherd, I want you to think about what do you need most where you are today from the great shepherd? Matthew chapter 9, verse 6 says, When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And maybe, maybe you're at a spot this morning where you've kind of drifted away or you feel yourself drifting away a little bit. What do you need most from him? To know that you are in a relationship with him? Cling to that offer. Cling to that truth. To know that he can give you all of your needs. He can satisfy and supply all of your needs. Do you need to find rest? Because he gives it. Do you need to find healing? Because he gives it. Do you need his guidance to be aware of his protection, to feel his presence, or to receive his blessing? It's all available to you, to us, from our great shepherd. I'll leave you with this. In Psalm 95, 7, it says, For he is our God. We are the people he watches over, the flock under his care. If only you would listen to his voice today. If only you would listen to his voice. And, and again, if, if you find yourself this morning that you're in a spot where you, you just think, well, I'm not hearing from God. I'm not feeling close to God. I'm not feeling in His presence. I encourage you to listen. I encourage you to draw close to Him because He'll draw close to you. I encourage you to put your whole life in Him and trust in Him fully. And if you have never made that commitment to claim Him as your shepherd, to claim Him as your Savior, today is a great day. I'd love to talk to you about surrendering to the great shepherd and giving your life fully to him so that all of us together could dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's pray together.